So thank you for the introduction and uh, welcome to my talk on our Usenix Security 2023 paper titled Content Type Multipart Oracle, Tapping into Format Oracles in Email End-to-End -end Encryption. Uh, as Jörg already said, my name is Fabian and this paper has joined work with Damian Podekniak, Sebastian Schinzel, uh, Tobias, uh, I messed up the order, Tobias Kappert, Christoph Ladjohan, and uh, yeah, some of them are here, are here, so be sure to say hi. <laughs> So as you might have guessed, this talk is about email because I mainly do email research. And so let's first talk about what an email is from a technical point of view. Since the 1990s, emails have been formatted to, according to the MIME standards, so the multipurpose internet mail extensions. Most of you probably know them from their use on the web. And every message consists of a body section and a header section. So you see the headers at the top and the body at the bottom, as you might have guessed. So the most important header for this talk will be the content type header. In this case, it's simply a text plain message. So this is usually a media type, in this case text, and a subtype plain, so plain text, as you might have guessed. So of course, MIME can do a lot more than just plain text. Most importantly for this talk, a MIME can do multi-part messages. So as the name implies, multi-part messages contain, uh, consist of multiple parts. In this case, we see a multi-part alternative message that consists of a text HTML message at the bottom and a plain text message at the top. And now if a client receives this message, they can choose which of that to display. These are processed from the bottom up, so the most faithful representation, so usually the one the sender actually used, so this message was probably composed in HTML and later converted to plain text, so it goes from the bottom to the top in this case. So this message could either look like this or like this, depending on either your choice of client or your personal preferences, um, for example, this is often done for newsletters or advertising emails, so people have the choice to display them in plain text. Of course, it's not the only type of multipart message we will see. There are also so-called multipart mixed messages. Multipart mixed messages, again, are processed from the top to the bottom, so there's some confusion there, but still, this is a simple concatenation of messages. So you, you read that from top to the bottom, you will have some plain text, in this case, hey Bob, look at my cool photo, and an actual photo. And this will look like this. I think it's customary to do a, a, an animal picture in these talks today. <laughs> so we'll have to talk about IMAP, because if a mail client wants to receive emails, they will have to use the Internet Message Access Protocol, or short, IMAP. You can do POP3, but mostly nobody does that anymore. So instead, we are using IMAP here, and we will only talk about IMAP version 4. Older versions don't interest us right now. So upon connecting to an IMAP server, the client will receive a greeting, which is not too important to this talk. They will send, then send commands, and first receive a so-called untagged response, usually with the data to the actual command, so the server will return some data, and then they will end the response with a tagged response. So far, so good. Now, of course, we want to retrieve our emails, because otherwise, why would you use email at all, or IMAP at all? So to do that, the client uses a, a so-called fetch command. This has two parameters mainly, the message ID, in this case one, and data items. In this case, we want to request the body structure of a message. Body structure, as the name implies, is the structure, uh, structure of the actual message body, so the structure of the actual content. So for the message, we, I've shown you two slides prior, the multipart alternative message, a body structure would look like this. So this looks complicated, but I will guide you through it. This is again read from the bottom up. So this is an alternative message, so a multipart alternative message that is left out from the body structure. And it has the boundary alter alternative. So if you look in the bottom right, you can see the string alternative with two dashes before that. That is basically the boundary between different parts. Then we have two parts. It's text HTML and text plain. One has a length 22, the other 29 and the other parameters are really not that important. So now the client has a choice. 
If they want to display only one part of this message, which they should do for a multi-part alternative message, they can say, hey, I really only want the plain text version by fetching body part one. So this is counted from the top again. Yeah, it's weird, I know. So what they will retrieve in return is, well, the plain old boring plain text message. So far so good. For now we have only talked about unencrypted messages. So of course most of you probably know that you can encrypt message, uh, messages in email, but why should you? Well, most of you probably remember Snowden and apparently the US government hasn't stopped with their email surveillance practices since then. Um, emails routinely get stolen by attackers either by attacking mail servers directly or through ransomware, uh, ransomware attacks, so as collateral damage. And well, some email providers apparently still scan your emails for targeted advertising, so that's great. So how would you decrypt your emails? Well, if you won't use a service like Tutanota, for example, which have their own implemented protocol for custom encryption, you probably will use either SMIME or OpenPGP. And SMIME is usually more used in a company context because it requires a whole PKA setup, so you need certificates and so on. While OpenPGP is, uh, I don't want to say easier, but uh, at least you can generate your own keys and uh, don't have to do the whole PKI dance. And so it's more often used by privacy aware folks or activists, if used at all. But let's look at an example SMIME email first. We'll only look at SMIME 3.2 in this talk because the relevant parts of SMIME 4, which was released like two years ago, aren't as far as we know implemented in any relevant client right now. So SMIME 3.2 for now. Again, this starts, of course, with a normal MIME message, the header, and in this case, the content type is application PKCS 7 MIME, which is just another word for the cryptographic message syntax, or the CMS which is just the binary container format for, well, cryptographic messages. So in this case, we have another parameter here, the SMIME type, which is envelope data, which just means we will use the CMS type envelope data, which is an encrypted message. So the body consists of a base64 uh, base encoded CMS message, which is, again, envelope data, which will start with the recipient infos, which is basically just a list of session keys encrypted with the RSA key, or it might be ECC, but usually it's RSA, uh, encrypted session keys. And then we will have the encrypted content info in which we say, hey, we will use this encryption algorithm, so the content encryption algorithm, which is, as you might see, not protected by anything right now, so no encryption here, no Mac, no anything. And then we will have the actual encrypted content, which usually is ISCBC encrypted. So as you might remember from our 2018 attacks, you can do bit flips on that and so on and so on. And at this point, you might have guessed in which direction this talk is going. So we are missing only one more building stone before we can get into the details of our research and into exploits. And that is decryption oracles. Let's assume we have some system that has, well, a private key which with, with, with which they decrypt messages automatically. This could be, for example, your email client. So you get an email, decrypt it automatically, and well, so far so good. Now let's assume that anyone can send you such a ciphertext to the system. Well, that is a reasonable assumption to make for email, for example. Now they will get something back. So it could be really anything. This is a side channel. So we have some, some indication of what happened to the system when we sent the ciphertext, the, the ciphertext to the system and decrypted it. This could, for example, just be a simple yes or no. This would be a Boolean oracle. So the system could say, yes, I was happy with that. I could decrypt it. This was all good. Or I don't know what you just sent me. And the other one could be a leaky oracle in which you get more details about the actual format of a message. For example, the e failure text would be a very leaky oracle because you got the whole plain text back. So this is the spectrum between yes and no, and here is everything. So the most famous uh, padding of the most famous format oracles you will see are padding oracle attacks. Yes, Sven briefly talked about them. So this is a CBC padding oracle attack. CBC padding works basically 
pretty easy. Let's assume we have a block size of eight bytes and a message of five bytes. Then we will fill the padding bytes with the value three because we need three padding bytes and we'll just check from the end if we decrypt that are all three values the same. All right, because, yeah, okay, now we have an oracle. If we send that to the oracle, it will of course say, yes, this is a correctly padded message. If, however, we instead flip a bit here, because this is ISCBC, though we can do that, we will have a two here, and the other values will be still three. So the oracle will say, no, this is not a correctly padded message. So if we instead XOR it with a two, we'll get a one at the end, and then this is one padding byte with a value of one, and this is, of course, a correctly padded message. You can use this oracle to decrypt uh, a plain text block pretty easily by 128 uh, requests per plain text byte on average. So format oracles are not only a thing for symmetric encryption, but they also work for uh, asymmetric encryption, as in the PKCS1 version 1.5 encoding you see here. So I won't get into details on the uh, Bleichenbach's milieu message attack. I assume you have heard at some point about it, but I'll just show you how many queries we are talking about here and how an oracle could work in general. So let's assume we have an oracle that checks this padding. This would, for example, the, be the padding to the recipient info I just I've just shown you a few slides prior. So for the symmetric key encrypted under RSA. So every oracle should check that the plain text begins with an O and a two. And if they only do that, that's great. That's about 10,000 queries to decrypt the cipher text. Great, if we have this oracle, access to this oracle. However, it doesn't stop there because there are a lot more elements to this padding. So this is way more complicated than the CBC padding. Next, an oracle could, for example, check for the zero byte here. So there has to be a zero byte, otherwise we wouldn't have a symmetric key. So as you can see, there's some random bytes and they are terminated by this zero byte and without it, there's no actual message. So that's the check that is performed here. If an oracle does that, well, we are already at around 40,000 queries. If the oracle, on the other hand, also checks if there are any zero bytes in the random plane tail, in the random bytes, so you are required to have at least eight random bytes, then we are already at 50,000 queries. And the last check one can do is, is the symmetric key the length I would expect? So you're doing IS 128, well, then the key should probably be 128 bits long. And if you do that, well, we are in the number of millions. So like 18 millions with the naive implementation. Oh no, that's already the better implementation. So this means a lot of requests. So you might have guessed maybe this is not the best case for email, but we'll try anyway. All right, we're done with the basics, so now let's get to the details of our paper. This paper is not the first to look at format oracles, at format oracle attacks on email end-to-end -end encryption. However, some required the victim to just quote reply the garbled message and apply some for, uh, transformation to get the message back. Others required large number of queries to be handled by either the user or some automatic server-based system. Again, others required very specific leaky oracles, for example, leaking error messages, exact error, exact error messages while decrypting. And uh, again, others, uh, namely the EFAIL attacks, required, well, leaking the whole plain text back to the attacker. We, on the other hand, wanted to go a different route and ensure that the attack works A, automatically, and B, without user interaction and without the use of side channels outside of the normal email ecosystem. Therefore, we concentrated our efforts on two attacker models. One being, well, the most simple attacker model you could have in email. You have an attacker that can send an email to an SMTP server. And the SMTP server or some subsequent system after it would act as the oracle and tell us, yes, this message was correctly padded, for example, or did something else. The other attacker model we have is a passive meddler in the middle attacker model on the IMAP connection between the mail client and the mail server. We assume at this point that this connection is TLS encrypted, so no breaking TLS for this talk, but still by looking at packet sizes and packet counts and so on, we can, we can use that as a format oracle. I'll show you how later. 
So note that both attackers always have access to the original encrypted message, and that is in line with what usually is the attacker model for end-to-end -end encrypted messaging. All right, let's start with the first exploit. So in August of 2022, 2020, 2021, somewhere a few years ago, not too long ago, uh, we were made aware that Google has implemented this SMTP message on their Google Workspace SMTP server. So Google Workspaces is basically a service for companies where you can upload your SMIME keys and they will transparently encrypt and decrypt and sign and verify emails for you. And they added this message that says, to prevent known SMIME vulnerabilities, note from me, this was about the e-fail vulnerabilities as they've later told us, Gmail does not accept SMIME encrypted messages without an accompanying valid SMIME signature. We pretty soon realized we could use this as an oracle. So let's first assume we have a message with broken CBC padding. So we have already manipulated the ciphertext, sent this to Google's SMTP server. Then Google's SMTP server will say, yes, this message is perfectly valid. There's nothing wrong with it because, of course, they don't want to leak that the padding is incorrect. If, however, you have a message with correct padding, but without a signature, because an attacker can simply strip that from the end of the message, or just in, don't include any at all, or break it through the padding, or so on, and so on, then will you, you will, of course, get the message above. Well, that works to decrypt whole message, messages just as simple as that, using the CBC padding oracle attack. So to summarize this exploit up, Google tried to fix our exploits from 2018 by adding mandatory signatures and uh, instead enabled Oracle attacks on SMI messages. All right, that was the easy one. Let's talk about attacks on email clients. It's a bit more involved and it involves the multi-part alternative messages I've shown you before. Basically, these are the tricks we need to turn the email client into an automatic Oracle. Our attack idea was as follows. We construct a multi-part alternative email that contains multiple encrypted parts, as you can see on the left-hand side, and each of these parts is a ciphertext query we will send to the format oracle. So as we have previously shown, the mail client will start fetching a, mes a message part, in this case the most bottom one, because they have both the same content type, so the mail client can't say, well, I only want the first one because it has to start from the bottom, and basically load the first one. So this will be the first Oracle query sent to the attacker, uh, to the make client, to the victim. And if this Oracle query returns a correct value, well, then the client might just log out, for example. So it will stop processing the email because it is done. It only has to display one of the alternatives. If, on the other hand, this Oracle returns a value that says, no, this is not, for example, correct padding, well, then they might go on to fetch the next message part and leak via that way to us that the message was incorrectly padded. So far, the idea. Great. We have a potential side channel that can be turned into an oracle. Now we just need a format check to abuse. In this case, before looking at the actual clients, we tried looking at open source libraries uh, that are used in many implementations to uh, in many email clients to look if we have any format oracle to use from the get-go. So for OpenPGP, it looks rather disappointing. OpenPGP added additional data to the session key inside the PKCS1 uh, PKCS version 1.5 padding. So we have an additional algorithm identifier, which is checked by all implementations. And they also added a two-byte checksum, which is just really a sum over the session key bytes. But that basically works to make the attack even more infeasible than it usually is. And it doesn't look much better, better for symmetric encryption because, well, they don't use CBC, so there's no CBC padding, but instead they use the CFB encryption mode, which just has no padding, so no padding oracles for us. And, well, they have some kind of integrity protection, the so-called modification detection code, and again, since 2018 and our EFA paper, implementations actually checked that. So ciphertext modifications have become a lot harder. 
There are, of course, some other format oracles as published by Marie et al., but we've also tested those and found that no client leaks actual error messages to the attacker, so we couldn't use those as well. So to so summarize that up for OpenPGP, it looked quite bad. We had no CBC padding oracle, and for the Bleichenbacher oracle, we are in the number of 2 to the 46, and uh, I won't even pretend to know what that number is. So let's look at SMIME instead. So we looked at SMIME libraries, especially network security services by Mozilla as used in Thunderbird, and at GPGME, which is the GNU-PG-based library for SMIME, or it's basically the library for GPG, but it also supports SMIME, let's say it that way. So this library is often used in open source clients for both SMIME and OpenPGP. NSS um, was a special case here regarding the CBC padding because they simply did not check it at all. So they just took the last byte and truncated the message. No checks, well, okay, no format oracle. Might have other problems, but at least no format oracle. And they were also a very bad oracle for the Bleichenbacher mini message attack, resulting in two to the 26 um, queries per message. So I don't, mean, don't know how you usually read the emails, but I don't open that many. And uh, GPGME was a bit better. They checked the CBC padding, so there might be an oracle here, but the Bleichenbacher padding was also a problem. So that doesn't, this doesn't look too good, at least for Bleichenbacher, and it gets a bit better, so we have one more trick up our sleeves. As I've shown you, the content encryption algorithm is not protected in the CMS, so we can basically change that to some algorithm that doesn't have a specific key length. So we can remove that test from the format oracle and make our oracle a bit stronger, but still, in the end, this still has 2 to the 29, uh, 2 to the 19 queries required, doesn't work. Okay, looks bad for now. We might have a CBC oracle for GPGME, but still, that's a big if. So let's look at clients, because of course we couldn't test all implementations. For example, Apple doesn't open source their crypto library in this case, so we couldn't test that beforehand. So let's look at clients. Clients, And we looked especially at SMIME-capable clients here and took 19 SMIME-able uh, clients to test. So we basically identified four factors necessary for a practical Oracle exploit. First, the client needs to support multiple encrypted parts in the first place. Second, it needs to employ automatic fetching of emails or parts of it in the background. So if we want an automatic Oracle, well, we will have to have some kind of automatism here. Third, it needs to do lazy fetching. So what we mean when we say lazy fetching is it will fetch body parts only when it needs them. So it doesn't do, well, give me the whole message and I will sort it out later. It will do, well, I need the first part, or okay, I need the second part now, now I need the third part, and so on. So this is required for the attack to work in the first place. And fourth, it needs to decrypt messages automatically in the background. So again, if we want an automatic oracle, well, it has to be automatic. So the first 10 clients basically were terminated from our tests simply because they don't support multiple encrypted parts, but only displayed one. This is also not very surprising after publishing multiple papers attacking email encryption that abused complex MIME trees to break email encryption. So basically, we shot ourselves in the foot again here. <laughs> oh well. So the next seven clients were eliminated because they don't do automatic fetching of emails. So they will tell you, hey, you have a new email and download it when you click on it. So no automatic oracle there. At this point, only two clients remain. So we were getting a bit nervous at this point. So this might be bad for us. Mailmate was eliminated because it does not do lazy fetching. But then mail on iOS, so Apple mail, the Apple mail client on iOS remains and it ticks all boxes. Phew, that was a close one. So the Oracle was a bit different than the one we expected. Instead of using multi-part alternative, we had to use multi-part mixed. Then one of the, when one of the mixed case fails to decrypt, so we assume the client fetches this email. If it's correct, they fetch the next one. And if that is incorrect, so a format check fails here, it will simply not fetch the third one. And that is basically the oracle we have here. So 
This was a bit more complicated in practice because Apple Mail does this in parallel, so they will do 10 parts at once and check that and only stop after, for example, 50 parts if one of them failed. So we had to do some stacking here and could only do one query per email. Sounds bad, but it's not, a, not as bad as it sounds. So still we had one problem remaining. We had no working format Oracle in iOS Mail. It's a very bad Bleichenbacher Oracle, Again, very, 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 very many queries. And it does not check the CBC padding in the first place. So they do the same as NSS, just truncate the message and be done with it. However, by chance, I found another oracle during testing, the so-called empty line oracle. iOS mail expects every mail to have a new line between the headers and the body, even for encrypted messages. So the MIME RFC explicit, explicitly states this has to be a backslash R, backslash N, backslash R, backslash N. So a classical new line. So if we send this message to the Oracle, we will get, OK, this is co a correct message. So we will see the behavior from the last slide. If instead we don't have any empty line here, so we add some text in between there, then Apple may will say, no, this is not a correctly padded message. And fortunately for us, they also accept a basic backslash n, backslash n, even though that is not in line with the MIME RFCs. So with some engineering, we were able to uh, use this as a format oracle to decrypt a 16-byte ciphertext block in as little as 900 emails, which sounds, sounds a lot until you realize, well, Apple Mail will do that in the background while you are, for example, on lunch break. So I'll now, now show you how to exploit this for a single ciphertext block. First, we need a setup phase. As I've told you, this empty line consists of at least two bytes. So, well, we have to guess two bytes. So we we'll iterate over them, hitting a lot of negatives, do that for a time, and finally, we'll hit backslash n, backslash n. So this is basically the setup phase, and yes, this takes some queries to do. Next, we can take one of these bytes we've just guessed, fix it to backslash n, and the other one to some arbitrary value, not backslash n. And start again by iterating over the third byte. So start at zero, try one, and finally we will arrive at backslash n again and can decrypt this byte again. So we will do that for every byte in the ciphertext block and finally end up with a decrypted ciphertext block in as little as 900 Oracle queries. Demo time. So I've prepared a demo video because this was, A, I don't want to do a live demo for this, and uh, B, it was patched like a month ago by Apple, finally, after one and a half years. So that took some time. So you will see in the, yes, you can see that, okay. On the right-hand side, you will see my iPhone. So that was basically this iPhone a month ago. And uh, at the top, you will see the script that generates, uh, generates the Oracle queries. And at the bottom, you will see a simple benign uh, email server that simply shows, hey, we deliver these messages to the client. Let's start. So as you can see, we start by generating the setup phase. So we are iterating over the first two bytes, and you can see Apple Mail dutifully st uh, starts downloading the messages. So I've started that manually by swiping down, but Apple Mail would have started after a few seconds. So you might see, oh, it's already gone, but sometimes you will see on the right hand some artificial messages that look really weird. Usually you will see, uh, this is a message with a lot, a lot of attachments. This is basically the Oracle query failed, and the ones where you'll see some weird text, that uh, those are the queries that actually worked. So if you look at the top window, you will see that we are generating new Oracle queries all the time, and we are done with the f setup phase now. So this took 47 seconds. Uh, I took the liberty to shorten this a bit for the video. But still, this took 178 queries, and the currently known bytes are 2F. So now we would start with the second round, and we'll look at that round. So we see we have already um, generated some new guesses. So basically, we have fixated the first two bytes, so we know those are 2F, and now we are guessing the third byte. And we'll do that for a time. You'll see Apple Mail will just download messages again and again and again and do anything without the user interacting with it. You will see that we are lowering the range in which the guesses are. So we are now finished with the second round. This took 24 seconds, so this was in real time. And 
26 queries, so not a lot. So let's jump to the end here of the video. So this is the last round. We are basically down to eight values for the last byte, and we'll have to wait a moment to see until it's finished. So we downloaded the last messages, and finally, yes, we have the last candidate, so the last value is an exclamation mark, and the whole attack took about 400 seconds. So uh, I don't do math on stage, but I think it's around seven minutes or so. So the video was shortened, but that's the actual time in the end. So we did some optimizations on the attack I've shown you on the last slide, but, but basically this is the time it takes to decrypt the whole ciphertext block. So this is not a lot for messages where you, know, where you want to know a specific position, uh, position. So for example, if you actually have a service that encrypts two-factor authentication codes, this would be pretty bad. All right, let's go back to the talk. So the remaining question is, why are so many of the clients not vulnerable to these attacks? And we basically identified two reasons for that. One being incomplete implementations. So most clients simply do not implement the whole range of features that the standards support. So for example, this was no selective fetching for some, uh, some mail clients, so they didn't do the whole multi-part fetching dance I've shown you before. And Others, well, they did no parallel decryption and no parallel fetching, so they only did that upon opening the message or did that in the bulk and so on and so on, so no automatic oracle here. All of these might be reasonable restrictions, but uh, I have, I'll have a word about that later. So, and the second, uh, second restriction that most clients, or some clients at least, had were implementation quirks. As I've told you, for example, Apple Mail and um, NSS simply did not check the CBC padding, so this is a weird stance to make. And this prevented, effectively prevented Oracle attacks, but is probably not a good choice to make. So we think that these resistances are quite futile defenses. So not only are they probably involuntary, I don't believe any developer has gone out and said, yes, I won't implement uh, multi-part fetching because I'm afraid of Oracle attacks. So this is probably an involuntary defense. And it interacts with the usability. So it makes the usability of email encryption even worse than it actually is right now. So for example, if I don't do multiple encrypted parts in a single message, I can't do separate encryption of attachments. So I can't take a large message with a large PDF document and encrypt the text for that and the actual attachment separately. So this might be bad if you don't want to download the whole message. Second, if I don't do decryption and fetching in the background, I can't do notifications to the user. So if I don't download your messages in the background, I can't notify you of the content of the message, and I can't notify you that you got a message at all. And in multi-device setups, this also greatly hinders searching. So if I don't download the messages automatically when you open the client and decrypt all of the messages, you basically won't be able to search through your encrypted messages, which, well, users don't like pretty much. And finally, this ties in with the first point. All users that have some reduced data usage contents or don't or have flaky connections. So if I'm riding uh, home on the train this afternoon, I'll have a flaky data connection, I'm pretty sure. And I will not be able to read large encrypted messages because I would be I would need to be able to download them in bulk. So I can't do that if I don't do selective fetching. So we think this is a rather unfortunate conflict. So security and usability shouldn't be in conflict because usually uh, usability will win at some point. So some developer might implement these features and make them, in this case, vulnerable to these attacks again. So what can we do instead? Sadly, client developers cannot do a lot right now. So I only have stopgap uh, fixes for now. The usual recommendation you will hear is just prevent oracles in the first place. 
And um, if you, I don't know if you remember like 10 years of TLS research, but that is pretty hard to do to prevent uh, oracles in the first place. So you'll have to do everything in constant time, you will have to be very careful with crypto, and so on and so on. For email, this even means you would have to do everything in constant time, and that includes rendering the message. So we have an example exploit in the paper which shows that if I can re uh, measure your rendering times for a message, I can also decrypt your messages. So I don't know if you even can do that. Yeah. And the second stopgap uh, stop measure is, well, do what I've told you just, what I've just told you not to do. So restrict the features, even though it restricts usability for now. This is, of course, well, not a good choice in the end. So what we really need are updated standards. So the RFC should be updated with, for one, authenticated encryption and dissociated data. So Jörg talked about that in his talk yesterday a bit what the actual authenticated data could be, uh, associated data could be in this case. And, well, the second case is maybe we should at this point just simply stop using RSA PKCS1 version 1.5 because all it does is enable million message attacks at this point. So in conclusion, fortunately many clients are safe against format oracle attacks. So this is good, this is good. But these defenses are mostly involuntary, and some attacks, as the attack against Google and the attack against Apple Mail on iOS, are still possible. So what we really need are explicit, count uh, explicit countermeasures to prevent these attacks in the future. Thank you for listening.